Hello, everyone. My name is John Pelfrey, and on behalf of the Harvard Law School, welcome to the book talk and celebration of Yochai Benkler's um, brand new exciting book, The Penguin and the Leviathan. Um, I am uh, very glad to welcome you on behalf of multiple institutions that are uh, eagerly hosting this event. Um, one is the Berkman Center for Internet and Society. Um, another is the Harvard Law School Library. Um, uh, Michelle Pierce and others I see here from the library, which has been hosting a series of books um, for uh, uh, book uh, talk events um, uh, for the Harvard Law School faculty. And um, what a wonderful outpouring this is, Yokai. Um, you're somebody who knows how to take hard ideas and put them before us and fill the room um, at the same time, which is such a wonderful, wonderful trait. Um, let me give a few uh, quick uh, uh, ministerial points and then quick introduction of Professor Benkler and I will turn it over. Um, one is this event is not being webcast live at the moment, but it is being uh, recorded. So um, during the Q&A, should you um, wish to interact with Professor Benkler, which I suspect you will, please press the button. Um, it will light up and become red, um, but you will be recorded, just so you uh, know of that. Uh, second, there'll be a reception after this event, um, which is just outside. We'll take the last question around 7.15 or so, um, and then we'll move out into the um, uh, antechamber or whatever that area is uh, out there um, for further celebration. Um, and last, the coop is um, selling books in the back, and I encourage you to buy them um, because it's a wonderful book and we all ought to have a copy. Um, and thank you to the coop for coming. Um, so, Yochai Benkler, to this crowd, needs um, very little, if any, introduction, but I figure I'll embarrass him for a moment anyway. Um, Yochai is the um, uh, Berkman Professor of Entrepreneurial Legal Studies here at Harvard Law School and a co-director, faculty co-director of the Berkman Center. Um, he is a beloved colleague and an amazing scholar and someone who we love to uh, celebrate and work with um, in this particular fashion. Uh, the book that he's written, The Penguin uh, and the Leviathan, uh, I think is an incredibly important work in lots of ways. It is the culmination of a fair amount of uh, work that he's been doing on the topic of cooperation, a series of um, uh, rigorous studies and experiments that cross a huge number of different um, disciplines. This is also still a work in progress. One of the exciting things about this book um, is that it's um, almost certainly a marker in time, but not the end of his work on cooperation in ways that I'm excited um, to learn from and to hear about. Um, another key point, I think, about this particular book, it builds on, in incredibly interesting ways, uh, the wealth of networks, his um, magisterial and ac very academically focused um, book. I heard somebody walking in earlier, uh, this was one of those overheards as we walked in, who said, you know, the wealth of networks was brilliant and it kind of helps to have a PhD to get all the way through it and really understand it. The Penguin and the Leviathan is just as brilliant, but you don't need that PhD and it's completely accessible, which I thought was an amazing compliment. Um, and I think this is uh, true of you, Yochai, and your scholarship, which is you take on the hard issues, you present um, the most rigorous research, and you reach a very broad swath of people. The Wealth of Networks was a book that won business uh, book awards, as well as being something that is um, cited consistently as the seminal work in the academic field. I'm totally confident that The Penguin and The Leviathan um, will have similar effects on our scholarship, but more broadly on society. And it's just a thrill to have you here to talk about it more. So um, with great thanks. Uh, Yokai Benkler. Um, <coughs> um, you wouldn't think that at this point I'd get um, excited and, uh, um, uh, by talking to a group of friends, uh, but I am. Uh, and you're so generous and so wonderful to have made this introduction. And thank you so much to uh, you, to all the staff at the Berkman Center, the library, Amar, thank you. <laughs> Uh, to, for putting this all together, and to all of you to come and have uh, uh, this uh, conversation uh, about this book. As John said, this is a very different kind of animal from uh, Wealth of Networks in the sense that I very much put an emphasis on trying to get a set of ideas out there in a form that many people who aren't academically, um, um, who don't have the patience or the time uh, could nonetheless access something that is grounded in a lot of serious uh, work. Um, and as I was trying to present today, I wanted to present this book because that's after all what I've said. But on the other hand, out there in our squares, a movement is growing that is teaching us all in the making about cooperation, about a set of values that's driving us. So here and there, I'll, I'll try to connect things that are in the book and speak to the moment that we're living, 
without lying about what's in the book. Uh, and, and, and bear with me uh, on that. So this is uh, actually from the introduction. It's not a lie. Uh, um, uh, and, it's, and it goes roughly like this. And it starts, in some senses, the, the reason for the book, the reason for why we need uh, this book. So this is October 23, 2008, uh, House uh, Committee. We live in a world built around a mistaken model of human motivation. We have four decades of exquisite refinement of systems from our workplaces to our banking systems to our network structures that are all built around this core fundamental error that Alan Greenspan, in a moment of truth, was able to relate to. And that basic error is not that we are sometimes self-interested. That's correct. That basic error is the idea that we can properly model and build our systems on assuming that we'll do well enough in designing our systems if we build them according to a model that assumes that part of rationality is self-interest. And that if we approximate who we are by saying that we are more or less uniformly, more or less self-interested, we won't go too wrong. Whether it's in building structures of control that depend on reward and punishment, whether it's building market systems that depend on getting the incentives right, by which we mean getting the material incentives right, in each of these cases, we've built system across a broad range that depend on this model and that turn out in work throughout multiple fields and multiple areas of practice to simply be wrong. And we stand today at a moment at which after somewhere between, depending on how you start to count, a literature of 25 or perhaps 15 years across all of these domains, scientific selfishness is retreating. And we need to learn how to adjust our systems design to this new model. A lot of words. Let's try to tell some stories. So one domain in which we recognize this very well is uh, Gary Becker's classic idea from 1968. The way to model crime is to think of it as a payoff structure, right? You've got the benefit of the crime relative to the penalty times the probability of detection. That's deterrence. That's where you get models like a three strikes law. You up the penalty given that there's a budgetary limit on how much enforcement you can do and you should get more deterrence and less crime. That's one domain. Another domain, incredibly uh, influential paper, uh, the Jensen and Murphy paper on performance pay and top management incentives, right? The idea that essentially the firm, the company is structured such that every level is going to try to shirk and grab more and put it in its pocket relative to those above. Oliver Williamson is the classic uh, uh, version of this model. But what happens, and so the, the mid-level managers look at the employees, the upper level management at the mid-level, and this agency problem is always a problem. What do you do at the very top? Who looks at the top? There you can get the same result by basically paying with stock options. So the shareholders and the CEOs are aligned because they're just trying to improve the performance of the shares. This worked fantastically for the CEOs. This, by the way, is scaled to the uh, 1986 compensation of GM's chair and Toyota's chair. Um, uh, so this is a fantastic theory for the people who have the power to implement it. It turns out in work that quite a few other people, including uh, not least uh, uh, Lucian Bebchuk here, have done to have actually worked pretty poorly for companies. Right? So you have relatively high levels of uh, uh, return to share, uh, relatively high levels of tax fraud, relatively low return uh, to shareholders. Uh, uh, there's substantial work to suggest that actually what you get is misalignment from this model, but it's a, it's a model that has the same view of motivation. Everyone from the top down tries to shirk, but they'll work well if we build the systems, either of punishment or of reward, 
to get everybody aligned in the same direction. And this is just across the street, so I'm picking up my kids from uh, their music lesson. And as I'm getting into the car, there's a woman with a maybe three-year-old, trying to get the three-year-old, perhaps two just because of the strong will, into the car. And she's saying, okay, get into the car. Get into the car or that's five cents off your allowance. Three, two, one, okay, that's five cents. Now get into the car or it's another five cents off your allowance. This model of who we are penetrates everywhere because every reasonably self-respecting educated person has gone through a system where the beauty of the models capable of being written to this simplifying assumption is so enormously persuasive. And yet, and yet um, uh, we see this across multiple, inte uh, uh, the intellectual arc moves in multiple areas. So if you look at evolutionary biology, for example, in the 1950s, we have all sorts of models of group selection. Why do uh, 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 starlings rise into the night? Uh, these more or less get dismissed as false in the uh, early to mid 60s with the rise of mathematical biology. Uh, you move from group selections to selfish gene, then to models of much more direct reciprocity with the classic being the evolution of cooperation and tit for tat, something that's very easily reducible to pay off to the individual gene as the model. You can translate cooperation into self-interested and we're safe from that side. We see it in economics. I barely need to say, to say anything, but even there, uh, you see mechanism design and efficiency all built on this same uh, model. In political theory, from down through Olson to Hardin, you see the same model of assuming the inability to come together to a shared uh, model, uh, to a shared set of goals, and instead the, these models of, of conflict. And in management science, organizational sociology, from Frederick Taylor, scientific management, and Weber, the model of the organization, and Schumpeter through Williamson that I've just described. That's an evolutionary, that, that's an intellectual arc. Now in each of these fields, obviously, although in evolutionary biology a lot less than in others, in each of these fields there are counter narratives. But these become the no dominant narratives throughout these fields. And yet she moves. And yet we live in a world in which persistently we see examples of behaviors that don't fit any of this. Whether it's parents who will work at a Wall Street firm and live in a framework that completely dedicates them to self-interest, telling their kids in the playground that they should share nicely with their toys, because that's the decent thing to do, all the way to models that say nothing will ever be written except for pay. I mean, my favorite story that, that, that Terry was just telling me uh, today about uh, um, um, using heat in yoga as a potentially copyrighted claim. Of all the bizarre ways in which ideology completely denies a doctrine in order to achieve uh, a property-like model. Um, and yet she moves. And what we've seen, and part of what I did in the work in Wealth of Networks and over the last uh, longer period, is how much online We've seen easily how we can cooperate. Things that shouldn't have worked, work. And of course, now we've come to a point where it's become a solution space. So whether you're talking about purely distributed systems like free software, like certain kinds of free software, or Wikipedia, or Ushahidi, whether you're talking about traditional NGOs leveraging social work, uh, production, whether you're talking about small organizations or IBM, big organizations like IBM leveraging free software, the whole notion that you can, as a practical matter, bring large collections of people effectively to cooperate in ways that have outcomes we care about, moved from being bizarre anarchistic nonsense 12 years ago, trust me, I know, to, hey, let's just do it. Of course, how else would you do it? Very quickly. That's in the practice of life. The theory hasn't necessarily caught up, at least at this basic level of theory. But we do see in each of these disciplines, across these various years, depending on different times, uh, the development of more complex models that allow for cooperation. So in evolutionary biology, the, step, the next step from direct reciprocity was indirect reciprocity. What does it mean, indirect reciprocity? 
I scratch your back today, someone else scratches my back some other day. And if there's enough structure in the population so that it's not completely uh, open for anyone to do anything, it turns out cooperation emerges much more easily than was modeled 30 years ago across a whole set of domains. Whether it's the reemergence of, re the reemergence of something like uh, uh, group uh, selection in the idea of multi-level selection, and I talk a little bit in the book uh, in one of the chapters about how that's developed, or the application of evolutionary models to uh, uh, cultural practices, so that evolution, when we talk about human beings, begins to be applied more in relationship to culture and breaking down the culture, na the, the, the nature nurture uh, debate as one that allows us to model cooperation among human beings. Uh, we're seeing tremendous amount of work there, and I'll give you an example in a minute. Uh, in economics, the shift to experimental economics and modeling away from self interest, the development of, neuro, uh, of, uh, of neuroeconomics or combining game mo uh, uh, experimental models uh, uh, with neuroscience and showing how people actually respond, not because we like to assume. One of the problems, of course, with economics is you can solve anything if you just assume the reason that I'm doing this is because I want to do it. The problem, of course, is once you actually see that uh, uh, neurologically people actually do get pleasure from cooperating or trusting in a certain way under certain conditions, introducing the assumption into the model becomes less of an act of picking friends from a crowd and more of an act of how do I model these things that I see in the world. It becomes a much more uh, grounded uh, uh, change. We see it in political theory, so uh, Lynn Ostrom's work on the commons in some regard is a, is a model, but obviously there's a lot more in the shift to the possibility of cooperation. And perhaps the earliest set of work on this was uh, in organizational sociology, beginning, I know it's a bad time to talk about Toyota, but Toyota production system and the shift that it introduced into production, the work on networks by multiple sociologists, again showing um, um, <clears throat> the possibility of cooperation. The core insight of all of these fields, each, by the way, independently, it's sometimes fascinating to read a paper in two disciplines, and they'll make the same points, and they have long citation lists, and they don't cross-reference each other because they're developing them independently in their own literature and citation practices, uh, is that this initial model of uniform self-interest that is more or less of a good design model uh, is abandoned or at least advanced, and then there's the debate within each of these disciplines. My favorite example, just because it's crisp, uh, is the comparison of these two quotes, and I hope you'll, you'll permit me to read. Uh, so in 1976, Richard Dawkins, who is a, a preeminent uh, a biologist, I don't need to tell you, the book is more complex than what I'm describing, but nonetheless, this is the uh, zeitgeist that it captured, this quote from the book. Be warned that if you wish, as I do, to build a society in which individuals cooperate generously and unselfish, unselfishly towards a common good, you can expect little help from biological nature. Let us try to teach generosity and altruism because we are born selfish. Let us understand what our own selfish genes are up to because we may then at least have the chance to upset their designs, something which no other species has ever aspired to do. Not ambiguous. 30 years later, Martin Novak from the program of evolution dynamics just down the street, perhaps the most remarkable aspect of evolution is its ability to generate cooperation in a competitive world. Thus, we might add natural cooperation as a third fundamental principle of evolution beside mutation and natural selection. That's a big shift within a discipline that we understand to be at the very core of science. And it's a shift not because Dawkins was an outlier and Novak is an outlier, but because, as I said, there was a, sh a progression of increasing sophistication in seeing just how much cooperation there is relative to the beautiful initial simple model and how much more likely we are to find cooperation occurring in nature given one of a set of mechanisms uh, uh, that I mentioned before. And what you see is a similar trans uh, transition in, in several other uh, disciplines. The thing to remember uh, about experimental economics is that most of the behavioral economics we read publicly and that gets a lot of attention has to do with what are perceived to be deviations from rationality, um, not having uh, preference orders that are trans any kind of, of, of instability, offer-ask problems. These are irrationalities. 
I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a particular branch within experimental economics that shows that we systematically behave as though we are not purely self-interested, or not all of us are self-interested, or not all of the time, which is not, has nothing to do with rationality and everything to do with what it is that we value. We can rationally pursue non-self-interest uh, non goals. That doesn't violate rationality in any way, shape, or form. So the debate within evolution is not a new one. Uh, I mean, the classic round is, is Herbert Spencer's survival of the fittest and social Darwinism versus Kropotkin's mutual aid and the idea that if you actually go to Siberia instead of to other places, you'll find a lot of mutual aid among uh, uh, species. But that, of course, was not what won the day 100 years ago. What won the day was the development of anthropology from Franz Boas and Margaret Mead and on to basically say, no, culture beats nature. Uh, but in fact, uh, what, we had in, uh, uh, what we have in the new generation of work in biology is more a revival of the Kropotkin response than a revival of the Boas and Mead uh, approach. That is to say, uh, an approach that, so some of the work, for example, uh, is work uh, that you see up there, some of the images, uh, showing empathy, showing the, the uh, brain imaging that shows uh, the phenomenon of empathy through essentially one partner's brain lighting up in a way that's almost identical to the way that it's lit up when they themselves are uh, shocked as when they see their partner shocked. There's a physical reaction that isn't there, but uh, other processing of emotional processing areas light up in exactly the same way that they light up uh, in the context of um, uh, being actually shocked. So I feel your pain turns out to be at least in some sense biologically correct or at least partly uh, correct. Uh, we see uh, so, so uh, the, wor the work, uh, for example, on oxytocin, the idea that essentially uh, this is a one, uh, one economic study which basically ran a trust game, which is a variant of, a, of a, uh, uh, an experimental economics game. Uh, uh, um, side one, the experimenter gives uh, one uh, subject a sum of money, that person can then give another player whom they don't see some portion of that. That other player then gets three times that amount from the experimenter and can do whatever they want. If they're fully trustworthy, if, if it's a complete relationship of trust, the first party will give everything to the second party. The second party will get it all tripled, that way the two of them get the most, and then they'll split it equally and they both are best off. In the classic self-interested model, because the first person can't do anything to make the second person give back anything, they won't give them anything. So in a no-trust model, the first person keeps it all in their pocket, the second person goes home with anything, and the experimenter keeps all the money. One of the interesting things in this particular study is that when uh, uh, a, particular, uh, 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 a particular chemical called oxytocin is given in nasal spray to the uh, subjects to the, who play number one, they trust a lot more. This turns out to be involved, for example, in the difference between monogamous and polygamous voles of various sorts, uh, and to be involved in all sorts of uh, trust uh, uh, engagements. The point is, you're beginning to see work like Kropotkin's looking at the book, trying to read the book of nature to tell us who we are. And from that, translating to the basic point that we care about trust, we care about fairness, et cetera, that we'll see uh, uh, beyond. Um, why does this matter? Why does it matter if we build a system that relies on an idea of universal self-interest versus one that says, actually, we're quite different from each other? There's a beautiful experiment by uh, uh, social psychologist Lee Ross and, and collaborators that does the following. It takes a standard finite prisoner's dilemma. Very short, seven rounds, not hard for anyone to figure out what the last round, the second, the next to last round, etc. By all predictions, everyone should defect in that prisoner's dilemma and no one should cooperate. You take, now, there's a lot of work across hundreds of studies showing that that's not how people behave in the lab. That's important. I describe it, but that's not what I care about here. What I care about here is that they took the exact same model of payoff, the exact same game, 
and they take it to, gave it to groups of, of, of American uh, students, to group of, of, of Israeli fighter pilots. And in each case, they distributed the groups and they said to one group, you're not going to play the Wall Street game. Or they sold them, you're not going to play the community game. They asked the commanders of the pilots and the teachers and, 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 and dorm uh, advisors of the students who would be cooperative and who wouldn't. And those people couldn't really tell who would or wouldn't be predictive. What did predict? When you told people they were playing the community game, 70% opened cooperatively and kept cooperating throughout the seven rounds. When you told the group that they were playing the Wall Street game, 30% opened cooperatively and declined over the course of the game. Which game, and this is the simplest of interventions. You can lie about this in a particular point, although you can't lie for long enough once people realize in which of the two games it is. But for me, what this captures is that, there, is that whether we are in a population largely of cooperators or in a population largely of self-interested actors depends on how we build the system they inhabit. Sure, there's a core, even when we say community game, there's a big minority, 30% in this case, who continue to behave as they're self-interested. They present a real challenge for any cooperative system that needs to be dealt with and needs to be understood. And there is a small uh, 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 core, again, in this case, interestingly, 30%, although in many other contexts, it's probably somewhere uh, closer to 20 or fewer percent, who will be cooperators even in a context where they're not expected to be. But there's a big middle who will be one or the other depending on the context they understand themselves to be. And if that's correct, then changing our systems design approach from one that assumes universal self-interest and designs for those self-interested actors to one that assumes diversity of motivation and tries to make sure that our systems are such that the big 40 or 50% in the middle treated as a cooperative enterprise, treated as one in which being trustworthy, doing the right thing, being empathetic, experiencing solidarity is the thing I'm supposed to do and the thing that I in fact will do, becomes a critically important design target. And when we think about controlling self-interest, to then not come back and pull the rug out of the cooperative side, not to end up making sure that only a minority end up being cooperative. So that's the reason or the target. So again, in all of these systems we talked about, you see the move from tough on crime to community policing is a model that changes multiple systems. It changes technical systems from walking, from being in a car to walking. Organization, instead of 911, uh, you have uh, a monthly community meetings, agenda settings, institutional, having more room for discretion, social, humanization, changing the us-them boundaries so that police officers don't only meet perpetrators and victims, uh, but also uh, normal people, changing across all of these systems to community policing. Unfortunately, we don't have very good studies that tell us whether community policing is better or uh, the new big board uh, uh, approaches that were developed uh, in New York are better, but we do know that this has become an A, successful, and B, widely adopted uh, in uh, most communities of any decent size uh, in the US. Uh, and we see the same thing, obviously, in the stories about Toyota production system and systems produ and, and team production that's been adopted very widely, and obviously from Britannica to Wikipedia. We see the fact that we have actual practices that are more cooperative and depend not on reward and punishment and monitoring, but on uh, cooperation and uh, uh, a, a set of design levers that I want to talk about to elicit internal compliance and intrinsic motivation rather than external control uh, uh, or, or reward and punishment. That's the, that's the primary move. And the point is, this isn't just about online. A big emphasis of this book for me is that we found it out in some sense powerfully online, but that's just because the set of costs associated with coming together and being effective was lower. It's much broader and it's something that's quite fundamental to everything we see and do. So essentially we need an integrated approach, technical, organizational, institutional, and social for cooperative human systems design. 
Um, uh, and we need to use the best evidence that we have. In this regard, John, I think you're absolutely right that this is the beginning of a project rather than the end, because it's an effort to throw out there, uh, here's the something we need to begin to develop. In that regard, it's probably also somewhat disappointing. right? There are no, there's no here are the 10 steps in which to build the best uh, uh, framework. It's, a, it's an invitation for a continuing conversation uh, more than anything else. Um, and there's a limit to how much we can get from evolution. It's, it's very uh, fashionable. It's uh, uh, incredibly uh, 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 exciting to talk about uh, uh, neurological studies and to talk about particularly evolution. Uh, but it's very hard to actually design systems from these things. We use that more as our modern religion to try to understand who we are by nature than we do to actually design systems. Instead, uh, what we see is a lot of work across many uh, uh, different uh, uh, disciplines that we can think of, or at least one way in which I try to think of this in order to try to explain to us why at the end of the day isn't it just enough to add money? Okay, so there are all of these complex motivations. Fine. But at the end of the day, if we add some more money, won't people do more of it? And if we put a punishment, won't people do less of it? And if that's true, so okay, so you've got this black box with lots of stuff going on. But at the end of the day, we can keep following the model for which we've had 40 years of evidence that Alan Greenspan was talking about, and things will turn out right. And I think the basic answer to that is what is sometimes called uh, crowding out, uh, motivation crowding out in uh, psychology literature, in some of the economics literature. Um, and one way of, of thinking of this is just as, as, as a set of forces. If you think of us as being, in some sense, uh, uh, tied to four engines or four horses or whatever the source of power that you think of, uh, and four is a number that's manageable for me to talk about, not because it's somehow uh, true, uh, but if you think of our material interests as something we really care about, we all know that in some sense we care about material interests, uh, we have to. We have to keep body and soul together if for no other reason. Uh, we care about a set of, uh, but it turns out we also care about morality. We also care about doing what we think is right, about uh, being treated fairly and treating others fairly and being in situations that we understand as fair, and that pulls us in a certain direction. We have a variety of emotional needs and affective responses to different uh, situations that pull us in a certain way because they tell us who we are. Um, uh, we have a whole work in sociology on social motivations and, and connections. Some of it that looks very much like money in the work on social capital that tried to bridge between economics and sociology. Uh, some of it in social network effects. Some of it in, in questions of group, uh, uh, of solidarity uh, uh, and group response. Uh, so the basic question is, if things don't align, how do they work? And the basic model you can think about, the classic model is the question of, of blood donation and how it plays out. So there's an old debate about the gift from 1970-71 uh, where Richard Titmus writes about the American and the UK blood donation system. Um, and the basic model, if we try to map it using these four motivations, is that if you have money for donating, then your material interests are strong to donate. Your moral commitments, it's still something good, but perhaps not so powerful. But if you're trying to signal, I'm the kind of person who donates, then it's not as good because you might be doing it for the pay. And if you're trying to tell yourself, who am I? What's my identity? I'm the kind of person who gives blood. Again, it doesn't do the job. So it says, don't donate blood. Go do something else. Um, this was a long, a long debate, classic debate. Um, and obviously, if you eliminate the money, then the material interests go towards don't give blood, and everything else increases and moves in the other direction. There's a nice study from 2008 in Sweden, which is at the baseline, um, uh, a donation system that basically takes this and says, OK, now we're going to pay you 50 krona uh, to register for this program. What happens? And essentially what happens is basically in the direction that fits uh, uh, motivation crowding out. Interestingly so, it was only statistically significant for women, not for men. And then they said, well, what about if this is a social signal or an emotional signal? What if we let people give the money away? Then it won't affect. And in fact, when you allowed the subjects to give the money they were getting for blood away to a children's uh, health uh, clinic, everything 
moved back theoretically and practically it all moved back to where? To where it started before the whole money exchange played out. What does that tell us? It tells us one important thing and one extremely important but frustrating thing. The important thing that it tells us is that we can't just add money or punishment. You re the motivation crowding out is a real phenomenon. It, you can map it onto these vectors of how you respond emotionally or socially and the social meaning of the act. Uh, but essentially, if you add money, you can suppress an activity more than you actually add from those who care about the material interests. That's important. What's important and frustrating is that the uh, response isn't uniform in the population. You may have gender effects, you may have specific uh, uh, sociological and cultural effects. Um, there, is, there are ways of collecting data, there are ways of slowly learning how to design these systems, but it's much harder than coming up with a simple mathematically tractable model that says, here's my utility function, give me more of it and I will work, and I don't know what all these things, let me just call it utiles or money, and I'll move forward. That comfort level we should have lost. What's hard about it is, of course, we don't have the full uh, um, uh, answer uh, beyond that. Um, so if we think about this idea of cooperative human systems, we can think of it in conceptual terms, in design terms, and in, polit and in terms of politics. Conceptually, it's a move from modeling rationality as universal self-interest, translatable into material concerns, to something that accepts a diversity of motivations and a preponderance of pro-social humanity sensitive to the conditions in which it is. And we need to learn specifically how to break that up and build systems. From a design perspective, it means that we're looking for design that's based on behaviorally realistic evidence-based design, not on models. Again, it's very easy to just come up with a model where you just add a few things into the utility function and all works well. One of the things that's making the work so slow is that you need evidence that we're comfortable with to be able to begin to shift those arguments in the utility function and to be able to give them weights and maybe measure them. And then there are all the limitations of experiments and how realistic or unrealistic they are, etc. From a political perspective, and this is where we begin to tie to uh, the Occupy movement, I think, quite directly, I think we were all, in some sense, raised on, an, on, on a model, at least in part of our studies, across these 30 or 40 years, to imagine that if we're trying to increase welfare, we need to get the incentives right first, and then we can deal with fairness through taxation and redistribution and all sorts of other things. But first of all, make the pie bigger. You couldn't possibly justify making the pie smaller. And then distribute. And I think one of the things that these, at least at the micro level experimental studies show us, is that you can't actually separate the two. That people care about fairness as an intrinsic part of their motivations. That you can't separate out the incentives from fairness and ethics and empathy and solidarity even as a matter of how effective and productive people will be, independent of the question of what sort of moral arguments you can make for how the pie needs to be divided. And so bringing that back into the question of how we design our uh, economic system uh, becomes a critical uh, political uh, implication of this work at the much broader level. So I talked to some extent about building blocks, about communication, about framing the situation, about empathy and solidarity, about what's right, fair, and normal, about calculation, about the various social dynamics. These are all things that I try to provide the literature in the book in, in a fairly accessible way about how we develop each of these as a potential design lever. Um, but it's, it's, it's moving on in time, and I want to get an opportunity for a conversation. So let me just pick out fairness ride through the other slides very quickly, come to a conclusion, and then if people want to ask about specific things, I'll go back to them in the presentation rather than me continuing uh, to talk. So let me talk about fairness. There's a tremendous amount of work now in experimental economics, more specifically than in others, about the question of fairness. Um, and by this, we should mean essentially three big buckets that describe the word. Fairness of outcomes, 
fairness of intentions, and fairness of processes. One of the things that we find out is that a sense of fairness is culturally contingent and diverse. So what counts as uh, fair in a given context can change in different societies. And there's a beautiful set of studies, particularly in small-scale societies, collaboration between anthropologists and economists, showing that once you move out of market societies, uh, there's quite a diverse set of what counts as a fair outcome. In this case, in ultimatum games and, and trust games, some of the workhorses of experimental economics. Um, but uh, uh, one of the interesting things in those studies is that actually in market societies, a 50-50 division is a reasonable place where people uh, uh, agree on when they don't uh, communicate. Uh, even though, again, in the model, there shouldn't be in these games anything like a fair distribution. But this basic outcome in an ultimatum game of a 50-50 uh, distribution as a major outcome and a 30% and a 30-70 distribution as the minimum before people just completely reject it and walk away, uh, is that it turns out that if you frame it in ways, well, you got lucky, you flipped the coin and that's why you got the money, as opposed to because you're the first subject. People are willing to let things lie where the luck is. Or if you filled out a short test so that somehow you have dessert in the money, then that's fine, you can keep more of it, you don't have to give 50 for me before I blow up this experiment. Um, that's powerful because these are obviously stories we tell ourselves in modern market societies about inequality. Luck of the draw, who I was born to. Dessert, I worked hard. These are the stories we tell ourselves and they turn out to play out in these experimental uh, settings. There's no single theory of justice. This happens to be a nice study that's got very, very uh, nice uh, studies from the cement industry. Uh, this is about cement trucking, and essentially looks at firms across uh, uh, that, are, that are regionally connected to each other and are occupying the same market, and in principle should all converge on the same pay scale because labor should in principle be mobile from one to the other. It turns out there's a lot of pay dispersion. Some, fair, some, uh, uh, some firms pay the same rate for the same seniority, others have wide disparities, that's on the outcomes, what they actually pay. There's also a big disparity in how the firms say that they pay. Some pay, some firms say, oh, we pay for performance. Others say we pay everyone equally. It turns out that some firms correctly describe what they do. They say pay for performance and they pay for performance and pay a little for a lot for a little performance, or they say pay equally and they and they do in fact pay equally. But it turns out, oddly enough, none of you will believe there are firms that don't do what they say they're doing. And they say we pay equally, but if somebody's a hard negotiator, they'll pay them a little bit more, or maybe if they're somehow connected uh, uh, otherwise. Um, or there are say, firms that say we pay for performance, but they don't really monitor and they have very little pay dispersion, they just say it. Well, as it turns out, when you measure in one case um, uh, the accident frequency and in the other uh, the out of service percentage, that is a real performance measures, you have fewer accidents and fewer out of service events if you're coherent. If you say you're equal and you're equal, or if you say you pay for performance and you pay for performance, you do better than if you're misaligned between what you say you're doing and what not. And we can completely see that there are two theories of justice. One is, you worked harder, you should earn more. You performed better. The other is, we're all doing roughly the same work, we should all be paid the same. The coherence between the fairness statement about how we ought to treat each other and be treated and the actual practice turns out to be more important than which of the two actually matters. Again, what that does to a great extent is that because there's no single theory of justice, we have to argue and negotiate. I mean, if you look at the 99% versus 53% debates over the Occupy uh, uh, movement, it's a clear debate about what's the theory of justice that should prevail systemically in the United States. Is it one that has at least some minimal equality so that you don't have all of the benefits going to the 1%? Or is it one that basically said, look, you, all of you who are getting and not paying, you shouldn't uh, be talking, stop whining, right? It's just the people who pay taxes who should, uh, who, who should uh, matter. It's a different theory of justice. And, we, and, and the critical thing, I think, is that we can't resolve this technocratically. There's no get the efficiency right first, and that's the technocratically correct answer. And that's the level of taxation and transfer 
And then let's talk about how, how we do it. There's no technocratic answer. These are competing theories that in turn are internalized to people's willingness and, uh, to, to engage in a system in a way that is intrinsically engaged as opposed to constantly pushing back against it. And that's a debate that is being had politically and over which uh, uh, there's real uh, um, uh, debate. Then there are intentions. People care about intentions as well as outcomes. If in the same experiments you let people roll a dice or have a computer force them to make a choice about how much they're giving the others, people are much more willing to just let the dice roll, dice fall where they are with them when they think that the other person is treating them unfairly. So much so that there's, this, there's a classic story about Herschel of Ostopoli who walks with a friend. He's sort of the, the classic uh, Eastern Jewish um, uh, joke character. And he walks down the street with a friend and they, and, and they see a cookie. And Herschel picks up the cookie and breaks it in two and gives the small part to his friend. And the friend looks at him and says, Herschel, what are you doing? He said, what do you want? What would you have done if you'd done the same thing? Well, had I picked up the cookie and broken it into a small part and a big part, I would have given you the big part and kept the small part for myself. And Herschel says, so what do you want? <laughs> Agency and how we treat each other becomes absolutely central to what it is that we care about in fairness, not only um, uh, in effectiveness. And we care enormously about processes. There's work from, from uh, criminologists like Tom Tyler about people's willingness to accept once procedural justice uh, uh, is seen as acceptable. I think one of the things that's very harsh to see in today's images is the militarized form of the police intervention vis-a-vis -vis the occupiers. That is a strict projection of repression and an effort to chill the speech in a way that is very powerful, very expressive, and at the same time is considered uh, part of the normal police technocratic work. That's a form of process of enforcement that's very different from what could be. When I was in Israel uh, in the summer, during some of the demonstrations. There was a demonstration with about 300,000 people. That is to say on the order of 5% of the country's population. You could barely see a cop on the street. Where they were there, they were relatively far away in simple uniforms, and that was it. That's a certain image you project to a crowd as opposed to the riot gear. And the response to the degree of acceptance of that policing is uh, commensurate. Um, so let me just finish up, there's lots of other stuff, but let me just finish up with a few points and then open it up. I think what we've been seeing, and part of what I try to describe in this book, is the retreat of scientific selfishness. The retreat of the idea that scientific policy making pushes us away from what we know and what we've been raised on in terms of a decency towards one another, a sharing and a collaboration. We've seen one decade's worth of actual practices in the networked environment, and increasingly visibly over the last 25 years in various businesses, reviving this sharing nicely idea, the broad pro-social educational bent that we infuse our children with. We're seeing diverse business and social production models begin to challenge the efficiency, efficacy, and growth-oriented effects of scientific selfishness. Essentially, science begins to push back with theoretical, experimental, and, observation, and observational work. It turns out from all of this that we aren't universally self-interested, that different people respond differently to empathy or solidarity, to ethics and fairness, to material payoffs. Sometimes it's each one of us at different times in different contexts will respond differently to each of these, and I think most of us have that memory within us. At one level, as an academic community, we need a new field of cooperative human systems design that accounts for the diversity of motivation and for the, non, the inability to add just money to make things work. But at another level, I think one of the things we need to do to recover from this moment that Greenspan's testimony captures so beautifully is a new view of a shared humanity that we have that in some sense we've all grown up with and know perhaps if not all, most. And at the same time, as we grow through uh, our, our educational system, we're taught in some sense to suppress it, to understand, to be somewhat cynical, to be somewhat cautious, to know that the right scientific, rigorous way to think about it is more in self-interest. 
And we need to overcome that and regain that capacity primarily and first and foremost to say, flip a coin more likely than not, in this case better than a flip of a coin, the person across from you is somebody with whom you can cooperate. And that's a big fundamental difference from a model that assumes we're all self-interested and need to cabin ourselves in these um, um, uh, um, systems that will force us to work in coordination, if not in genuine cooperation. That's the project of trying to begin to help us leverage from science to a sense of shared humanity. Okay, thank you. That was fantastic. And um, for those who haven't yet read the book, still do, even though you told some of the stories that are in the book and the Greenspan and the Dawkins, those are in there. You left a lot on the table in terms of stories in particular. So anybody watching the video still ought to read the book <laughs> and anybody here. All right, I can imagine there are lots of hands ready to go up. Um, we'll have Adam. Um, and do you mind please uh, press your button? If you're willing to tell us who you are on the record, we'd love it. Yeah, I'm a friend of your highs. My name is Shibli Malad. I'm, visit I'm visiting at the law school. Yochai, this is fascinating, and I can't wait to read the book. But let me give you two knee-jerk reactions on, um, on the theory behind it. One is that the passage from the domain of science, in particular the issue of uh, biology and evolution, to the social sciences has long been discredited because we are talking about two different things that we cannot extrapolate from to explain society. And the other dimension is that going back to the Greenspan issue, no doubt there are two aspects of each one of us and we are being coerced into a design that has been dominantly leviathanized. But the question is that there is an objective limit to this um, and the argument that the reason why people are in the street to criticize the way the banking system has served them so poorly can be responded to by saying let's have more cooperation is uh, too simple because the material interests that the bankers have are not defined by a theory that says you have to follow Leviathan and market, but it's supported by an obvious self-interest that transforms the battle really in one which Marx has long under, underlined as one that cannot be solved that simply by moving from one design to the other. So, so Chibli, that's as always uh, incisive and, and hard. The first part easier, I think, than the, than the second. Um, so the first argument you made was this whole sociobiology stuff, eh, who cares, it's old. Uh, and it's been discredited. I think that's a uh, description of the state of various disciplines that is uh, true of the early to mid 80s but is no longer descriptively true in terms of just how much you are seeing more social sciences, uh, economics in particular, trying to move to, and as well as some aspects of anthropology, trying to move to evolutionary modeling and evolutionary uh, models to explain social sciences. So in some sense, the, the richness and complexity and ability to remain agnostic to the outcome like economics want, but without assuming universal self-interest, and at the same time a rigorous mathematical modeling has become extremely attractive to try to model economic and, and social interactions in evolutionary terms. And so what was in the early 80s resolved seems even in more of the social sciences less resolved. The second point is, and I struggled with this exact problem in, in writing this chapter uh, of the book, uh, and in using some of the materials later on, is that we use science, and particularly evolution, we use evolutionary science as a way to negotiate our conception of, the, it's a religion. It's a way of understanding the order of the universe and our place in it. 
So that's why I start by talking about how the discipline has changed because it's a religious disputation about ourselves in the universe and our place in it. But then say, but it's not where we learn the design levers from. For that, we need to go to the real social sciences. And yet there are components, particularly in the neuroscience work, that do have direct feed-ins and in the models that transfer to, to, uh, um, uh, to cultural uh, uh, evolution. The second question. The second question was, um, yeah, cooperation, sure, but bankers self-select because they care about money. They control this system. It's in their self-interest to keep it as it is. How are you going to change that? There's a real answer, which is, well, that's a lot of work. But that's not an interesting answer. So I'll answer anyway. Um, one of the problems that happens when you have a system that's optimized for money, so that money also becomes the social signal, right? If I make a million and a buck or a million and three bucks, doesn't matter to me on the material interest side as much as the fact that the fact that that person got a million and three means that he's more valued. I want a million and four. It becomes the way in which we translate even the social motivations. But it obviously also self-selects for people who are driven by that, the population. There's a lot of people in the population who care about that. So if you're trying to look at um, uh, interventions, what would happen? So, so, so Bruno Frey and Margit, uh, and Margit Ostolo have a beautiful uh, paper uh, called Why uh, Executives Should Be Paid Like Bureaucrats. That is to say, what would happen if you externally, politically, forced payments to be more bureaucratic and much more related to worker pay? So, you know, the differences between when, uh, when Jensen and Murphy, in the 80s, um, Japanese ratios of CEO pay to worker pay was about 1 to 26. The US, if I remember this off the top of my head, was around 1 to 40, 1 to 50. Europe was somewhere in the middle. After the Jensen and Murphy piece gave rise to this, sure, you should pay in stock options, the US went to 1 to 500, white to 600, without Japan and Europe following to the same extent. Uh, at all. So you got a different set of people. So that's an intervention that basically says don't pull these people. Do you or don't you introduce ethics into and professional ethics into business? We as lawyers have professional ethics all the time. We know their limitations, but we at least have something to touch against. When we try to train people for mediation, so in the communication part I talk about some of the handbooks and differences between litigation and mediation. We try to teach different values to get people not to my side wins, but let's figure out where. The, so you train people differently. That's a long-term intervention. Is it hard? Sure it's hard. When you talk to some of the businesses, I don't know, like IBM, who are trying to interface with the networked, uh, um, uh, with the networked environment and try to connect, to, say, for example, open source uh, projects. One of the problems is the kind of person who can be an effective participant in open source development for IBM is a very different kind of person from the person who can weave their way up in a bureaucratic hierarchy. An organization has to begin to learn who the right people are for itself. So if you're lucky and you have an organization, somebody relatively at the top who understands that, they begin to find these ways and develop processes to identify different talent that responds differently. Say, valuing the fact that people go out and were part of the Peace Corps as opposed to uh, ran straight from business school. Those are the kinds of interventions. They're not a from today for, to tomorrow, but I think that they do tie to the specific uh, uh, sources of insight, as opposed to just waving my arms and saying, do these things, which is really the effort of trying to translate what we have from the evidence, which is incomplete, into a set of at least first-line interventions, which are also incomplete. Two obviously great questions with lots to respond. Sasha. So uh, just to push you a little bit further on this, I mean, I, I love this work, as you know. But so today, um, I'm a new professor at MIT. And today, uh, my department was visited by someone from the licensing office. Um, so they gave us a very nice PowerPoint um, about the model through which uh, anything, any ideas that we develop can easily be uh, copyrighted and patented and, and so on. And when I asked him about uh, alternative licensing models, he did have an answer, which was that, yes, we, we certainly do that. There's the MIT license. We have open licensing. Um, but it was really a yes, but answer. And when I tried to push him a little bit further and talk about, well, 
it would be interesting since there is such a broad transformation in so many domains of knowledge production and invention to actually have resources in your office devoted to helping people learn about these other modes. Um, his answer was, well, you know, talk to the top of the hierarchy. You know, my office does what it does. And, and so I guess the question is how do we, um, I guess, sort of normalize or infiltrate or generate spaces where these forms or modes of, of, of distributed and shared and networked production can be system, systematized across the whole educational system, especially in a context where those who are responsible for doing that work are responding to the imperatives given to them by those who were very good at climbing to the top of, of the hierarchy based on the previous model. So I think that's, again, a, a fascinating and very real world uh, problem. Uh, and in this room, there are many people who are working on it in different ways. Um, uh, as with any other context, uh, to some extent you fight, to some extent you argue, and sometimes you even persuade. Um, the question of university licensing uh, is, a, is, is a combination of all of these. So if you look, uh, for example, at, the, uh, at, at, at university uh, 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 at university open access publication. So, John, you're part of this uh, uh, major project uh, here. Stuart Schieber, who's uh, one of the directors of the uh, uh, Berkman Center and of the Computer Science Department. Uh, uh, Bob Darton, the, the library, pushes forward in the faculty. We, uh, we use, this is what's interesting, we use our power in the hierarchy of universities to raise a flag and say, we care and we can do it this way. That is to say, we can all commit in these uh, 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 faculties and this law school as well to distribute our work freely. And that allows somebody else to come and say, hey, look at what they did. It's feasible. Um, I think there was a lot of this business of people uh, doing their own uh, uh, releasing and then getting other people. You know, after I released Wealth of Networks uh, freely on the web the first day that it came out, and that was the first university press sort of book type thing that came out. Um, I got emails from all sorts of people who were trying to negotiate. What did you do? What did you say? Well, get another offer. Start getting them to uh, feel like they want to and negotiate hard and ultimately point to see what happened with the sales of that thing or what happened with the sales of the other. Um, and then you have to, uh, and then there's, there's, there's politics. So if you've got the student organization, University Allied for Essential Medicines, it starts out with patenting for essential medicines and becomes more generally a student organization that's trying to pull universities uh, in. There's no question, universities should in principle be easier because in some sense, our business model does not depend on this thing in the least. Uh, though there are people for whom their metrics of success is succeeding, that's their job. Following from a statute that says, yeah. Just, just really quickly on that, he, one of his slides showed that uh, MIT sort of held up as you know, one of the uh, most successful uh, examples of the licensing to, yeah, two to three percent of income of the university you know, came from this licensing. Yeah. So. so this is a paper that I, when I tried to measure there about 10 years ago when I did a paper on this, you know, it ranged from half a percent in University of California to that's all. It's not a rounding error, but, it's, but for many universities it is. For many universities, actually, the cost of the office doesn't cover the revenues, but it's the thing to do. And that's part of what I'm trying to do with this book is get people to stop thinking that it's the thing to do because science tells us so. No, science doesn't tell us so. I will note that both your book at Yale University Press that was open and Jonathan Zittrens, who was in the back, I saw him before. Um, the he got wise. He did. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Future of the Internet, both were available open access and sold uh, for academic books were blockbusters, right? I mean, they, they're really, that is two amazing data points, both from Yale University Press, notably. Uh, how about someone in the back? Yes, sir, right in front of the microphone, in the uh, camera. Uh, yo, hi, I'm completely convinced uh, uh, a Nobel laureate in economics uh, once said it's safe to assume that people are self-interest with guile. And clearly science does not support this. So Oliver Williamson may be a Nobel laureate in economics, but uh, he was probably wrong on this. What I hope to uh, get from you is what are the burning policy implications of this shift in the way we view the world? So if you had a magic wand 
and you could just fly around and make people see the light, make people understand that we should conceptualize humans not as self-interest with guile, but as cooperators, where do you think we would get the biggest bang for the buck? Where should we start? Should we make Congress more cooperative? Should we uh, change the patent system? Should we change the way organizations work? Who should pay attention to this? Who should be the foremost uh, people that should pay attention to these uh, findings? So uh, thanks. That's a real and hard question. Uh, in the interest of full disclosure, I don't answer it in this book. Here and there from the examples, it begins to point in the direction. I think, for example, that a more formal assessment of the relative success of community policing and big board approaches is an important intervention in the day-to-day -day control of large populations and the degree to which they are or are not free. That's a level. Again, look at the squares, look at the parks. The basic question of whether or not we continue to build a society that is built on maximizing total growth or a society that trades off some form of total growth, uh, growth with a more equitable distribution of outcomes, with some minimal set of capabilities. Am I able to back out of this, anything like whether or not the model is living wage or a certain level of uh, um, uh, um, uh, educational uh, uh, tax subsidies or something else, I can't. Each, what I can and what I have tried to say is that these kinds of interventions, and purposefully I'm not going to patent, I'm not going to open access, I'm not going the networks, although there I am much co more competent to speak specifically because I want to make it very clear that the point is much broader and deeper. And that I think that the, we might call it Washington Consensus, if that's what we want to call it, the particular model that has typified essentially the last 20 years to, or really since the 70s uh, of deregulation is one that is built on an erroneous model of interest that has contributed at least to some extent to this uh, uh, pattern of internal uh, ratcheting up of the degree to which people who are self-interested are running certain organizations and systems leading to uh, their failures. Um, and that's the, those are the biggest policy questions, but in some sense they're also the most distant because the work that I use is all done at the micro level. Right? None of this work says an organization isn't self-interested. I don't know anything about that because we don't have work of this kind. The work is all done at the micro. In some senses, the book plays the role of who we are and what is our place in nature to plug into those debates rather, rather than the immediate translations. There are immediate translations. So if you talk about copyright in music, the idea that musicians really need uh, these payoffs is simply false descriptively. We all know it from actual observations of the market. The idea that the only way you'll get people to pay for their musician, to support their musicians, is if you force them uh, criminally. That's false. We have empirical data for that. That's something that I do talk about a little bit in the book. So there are places where the relationship between the micro motivations and the, uh, and the institutional intervention are very close and are relatively easy to make. And there are places that are much more fundamental. And I try in the book to play a little bit between both of those levels, but not do much of the translation. I think, okay, you sell yourself a little short. Chapter 10 on how to raise a penguin seems to be, in fact, maybe some of that description. Although that's more about organizational structures design, and processes yep. than it is about policy questions, oh, which right. is what Shane was asking about. That sounds right. Um, so we've had a couple questions or comments that all seem pretty friendly and agreeable. I wonder, is there anyone who really, it's kind of in a fundamental way, disagrees who wants to crack it? And then there'll be one final question. Yes, sir, you're on with the disagreement. Bob Zastro, I worked in corporate America for most of my life and also as a federal cross prosecutor. One comment, I've looked at pay inequality in Japan for a while and in the United States. And if you look at that in relation to corporate compliance, the last thing that I think makes a difference is the degree of gap between the manager and the worker. If, for example, you look at 
antitrust compliance in Japan vis-a-vis -vis America. Uh, it is much higher in the United States because the deterrent regimes are very, very effective and they're very well enforced. If you look at America, for example, 50 or 60 years ago, when my granddad ran Railway Express, and I think he made $25,000 a year or something like that, and compared just to a level of compliance on things we all care about, which are civil rights, you know, environmental protection, antitrust, um, I wouldn't say disclosure uh, to consumers, but in a, in a whole set of things, compliance is, uh, you know, much better uh, in the current view, and it's much better in America vis-a-vis -vis many other countries. In, you know, price fixing cartels, for example, don't have meetings in America because they know the FBI may be knocking at the door. Um, so do you have any other prescriptions for reforming corporate America in, in areas where we all con are concerned about other than just compressing salaries? Um, so several things. That's a rich and, and, and good set of questions, several things. The first is, the once you're talking about the behavior of a corporation or organization, uh, it's, we don't have the same kind of data on what happens within a corporate decision making. When people see their role as agents of someone else, so they're not acting for themselves, you begin to have conflicts about the ethics of the role and the ethics of the individual. Sometimes doing something that's skirting the edge for the good of my shareholders, my community, my whatever, becomes morally acceptable given the framework of what my role is, my fiduciary duty, et cetera. And so then you need the external enforcement. No, I'll actually do them poorly. So it's very hard for me to say at the level of corporate enforcement uh, what to do except to then begin to look at, are you talking about individual? Are you talking about corporate incentives? Um, how do you, are you able to essentially change the perception of these uh, 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 corporate managers about what they're supposed to do? I think a lot of people would, would agree that the one thing that really does make a huge difference is jail time uh, for the executive and the probability of getting caught, which was a huge problem in our securities debacle. And if you compare the record of securities enforcement and antitrust enforcement, for example, in the United States, you'll see that it is relatively certain jail time, if you're convicted, is a huge deterrent and is very effective. How would, they, how would you then explain the findings, for example, that uh, pay disparity uh, um, um, or pay ratio um, predicts probability of tax fraud, which where you keep the baseline. So this is one of the, one of the early 2000s studies that tries to, to test Jensen and Murphy. Same baseline uh, enforcement on the background, but a real contributor is the extent to which you've got uh, 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 stock options, or not, not the pay ratio, but whether or not you have stock options predicts tax fraud uh, um, um, outcomes. I really can't. I don't know. I'm just coming with my examples so, and the so, ones that I'm familiar with. I would urge you, though, really to take a look at the record of in a trust enforcement over time mm -hmm. and also transnationally, because I think that would be a counterexample. So my point, though, is that there's no question that adding money or adding punishment has effects on behavior. The question in each context, and this is why I was trying to be very careful about talking about specific context and specific evidence based on what we can actually uh, observe and measure, is whether or not the intervention at the margin of enforcement has effects that are beneficial or not beneficial on the behavior relative to interventions that are more cooperative in nature. Would that be education? Would that be limiting pay? Those are, those are the levers with which uh, uh, at the moment, we have a little bit of data, but that's all we have at the moment. Fair point. Yoko, are you ready for one more final question? I, sure, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Emily Dexter, and um, if a principal of a high school came to you, and the high school served a very 
you know, multi-ethnic, multi-income, diverse population. So there are a lot of different interests and a lot of different people trying to get different things out of their educational system. And this was sort of your typical high school with different types of courses and teachers and uh, all those sorts of things. What kinds of ideas would you want to see that? How, how could your ideas influence a secondary school, for example? Um, so I'm, I'm very fortunate to be the son of someone who founded three schools in Israel over the course of, of, of her life. Uh, actually, no, it's two schools and one volunteer organization. So, so um, uh, dealing with exactly this question in populations of extremely poor parts of the city, as well as in a magnet school that brought people from all over the city. And in that regard, the lessons are relatively uh, straightforward, which is to say, higher degrees of autonomy, higher degrees of trust, um, structure as a, uh, with, with clearly set goals, but at the same time a good bit of teamwork and cooperation between the students, a less hierarchical and less distant relationship between teachers uh, and students. Um, uh, high stakes testing uh, doesn't seem to me to have been particularly effective on the side of motivating teachers, at least that's what I think um, um, uh, we're beginning to see um, 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 here in the results here. So in that regard, because you're talking again at the micro level of what works with kids and getting them to want to learn, to want to cooperate, to want to behave, uh, that's the set of solutions. How easy it is when you're talking about a population that comes from a very low trust environment, that has a long personal history of being treated uh, uh, aggressively is a very different question. But I think in that domain, the application is, is much more direct, and there's literature within the education uh, literature that talks about somewhat more open with greater trust uh, models and the uh, performance effects relative to much more rigid, rigid architectures. Uh, and, that, and that's, in some sense, some of the primary materials that I see rather than where I would, what I would learn from rather than what I would try to teach. Yokai, this was a great gift. Thank you so much. This was a wonderful evening. Thank you.